Hi everybody, Physics Ninja. Today I've got something a little bit different for you. This week, uh, the kids at the college where I teach had their first exam. And early in the week, I helped them prepare for the exam by having them submit problems and then helping them solve the problem. So the class is a first year physics for engineering uh, class. Uh, which looks at electricity and magnetism. Now, the first exam deals with mainly electricity part of it, okay? Now, anyway, I solved 12 problems for them that they submitted. The problems were really wide-ranging, okay? And here are some of the topics that we looked at and that's covered in these problems. Uh, we looked at electric forces and fields and applying, uh, calculating electric flux and Gauss's law. Now, what else? We looked at calculating the electrical potential and the potential difference. All types of geometries were considered from parallel plates to curved wires to uh, concentric spheres, concentric uh, conducting tubes, and so forth. Um, in addition, we also, this exam also covered capacitor circuits. So we looked at three different problems involving capacitor circuits. Now, this is how I suggest you go through this if you're studying these topics right now. Uh, I put two PDFs and all you have to do is go in the comments section and you'll be able to access both of them. They're on a shared drive. One PDF contains only the problems, so you can read the problems ahead of time and then jump to the part of the video that you're interested in once you give it a try. So the second PDF includes kind of just snapshots of uh, the screens over here. So it has the problems and the solutions. All right, like with all my videos, if you like it, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to Physics Ninja. It's the best way to support me. All right, let's get started. All right, so uh, this is the first problem. So we have a charge Q1 here at the origin and charge Q2. Uh, one of them's positive, the other one's negative. All right, uh, what else? It's placed four centimeters away. All right, you have these two small surfaces. They're part of, this dashed line represents a Gaussian surface. So they wanna compare the density of the field lines, N1 and N2, which pass through these tiny surfaces. Okay. So another way of saying this is, they wanna know where the electric field is going to be the strongest, right? If you have a high density of field lines, it means that the electric field is strong in that region. Okay. That's really what this question boils down to. So imagine over here at position uh, on this side over here, okay, where DA1 is. Let's think about all the electric fields that are being produced here. So there's the charge Q1, which is positive. If it's positive at that position, it's producing an electric field that goes like this. I'm going to call this E1. Okay. That's that direction. What else? Uh, now they have Q2. Q2 is negative. I'm going to make this one orange over here. Okay. Uh, this one here at position of DA1, it produces an electric field that points this way. Okay, So this is E2. Now I want to compare that to the other side. Okay. The other side looks like this. So both of those fields produced by both point charges, they're in the same direction. How about the other side now? DA2. So let me call this DA2, a little bit of area on the other side. Again, if I look at that positive charge, that positive charge at this point produces an electric field which is going to be like this, and it should be smaller than the first one that I drew because it's farther away from that point charge, right? This surface area is, you know, it's far from the point charge. All right, how about the negative charge Q2? That produces an electric field like this, okay? E2. Have a look at these two magnitudes for E2. They're going to be the same, right? Because it's the same distance away right here from, uh, from that point charge. Whether I go to the left or to the right, it's going to be the same. All right. So based on this information, look what you have, right? You have a larger field if I add both of those. So you would expect that the intensity of the field is stronger there. So there would be more field lines right, passing through that surface, N1. All right, so I think the best choice for this one um, has to be that N1 is greater than N2, right, just because the field is bigger. Okay. All right, the next one now, uh, question nine here says, just want to make sure nobody else is trying to get in. Uh, let me see. No, we're good here. I'm going to move this chat window to the side and get the participants. I usually don't have this many people online, so... Okay, we're good. Move this down. All right, um, problem 
two says, what is the net flux that passes through this entire Gaussian surface? The Gaussian surface is that dashed line over there, okay? So this is, you have to remember what Gauss's law means. If they're asking you for the net flux that passes through that Gaussian surface, well, the net flux is what? The definition is it's Q enclosed divided by epsilon zero. That's the definition. And the charge that's enclosed in that dashed line is only Q2 enclosed. So it's really Q2 divided by epsilon zero. Uh, Q2 is minus six times 10 to the minus six coulombs divided by epsilon zero, 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. Uh, you put that in the calculator. Uh, you'll get a negative uh, number. So it has to be one of those. And I think it's uh, choice C. Let me do it, actually. If I'm going to record this, I may as well get the right answer. Uh, 6 e to the 6 divided by 8.85. Oh, 6 e to the minus 6. Try that again. e to the minus 6 divided by 8.85 e to the minus 12. All right, yeah, 6.8. Uh, 10 to the 5. So I think the best choice here. It has to be negative, right? Because the charge is negative. Okay. Uh, it's a good question. Um, oh, it should be. There's no way you have to remember this. If not, I'll just write it on the whiteboard. Good question. Okay, so epsilon 0. I mean, this is not a memorization thing. So it, I, I'll have to double check if it's there. If not, I'll give it to you. Okay. All right. So uh, pretty straightforward, I think. The first one seems a bit odd, right? We haven't seen maybe that style of question, but again, the density of field lines is related to the strength of the field. So, um, all right, let's try the next one. Any questions about this one? No, let's move on. All right, this is a new kind of problem here. So they pertain kind of to this picture. So what we have are two conducting spheres. Okay, so that's kind of always a key, right? Make sure you highlight that. When it's conducting, it says something. They have the same charge, okay? Uh, one and two have this charge, 3.8, 10 to the minus six. They're separated by the distance that's larger than the diameter. So they're as depicted in this figure A. A third identical sphere, all right, having an insulated handle is initially uncharged and touches sphere one, okay? That's part B. Then to sphere two, that's diagram C over here. And finally removed. Okay, so kind of a nice problem here. They ask, what is the final charge on sphere two? So the one thing that you also have to note is they are identical. Okay, that means that the radii are all the same. Okay, if the radius is the same, when two metals touch each other, we saw that the potential, right, has to be the same. They become one equipotential. Okay, that's the key to this one. And the equipotential of any sphere is kq divided by the radius of that sphere, okay? However, since k is the constant and r is going to be the same for every single one of them, right? It's basically just proportional to the charge, okay? The other concept that you need here is you need to have conservation of charge. So imagine here you start with q and q. <laughs> Okay, and now I touch. So what's going to happen? If one and three are going to be at the same potential after, right? V and V have to be at the same potential. It means they have to have the same amount of charge after, okay? So for part B here, you have to have that Q1 final has to be equal to Q3 final, okay? This is a requirement. The other thing that we need is Q1 final plus Q3 final, well, has to be equal to the total charge that you started with, right? We only started, Q3 initially had no charge. Q1 had all the charge, so the total charge that's available is Q, okay? So what does that mean if you combine both of those? It means that Q1 final has to be half of the original charge. So at this position, they're going to be left with Q over 2 and Q over 2. Okay. All right. Now in picture 3, what happens? So for part C over here, guess what happens? So you have 
charge number or sphere number two and sphere number three that are like this. Okay? This is the initial configuration. Initially, how much charge do we have? Q3 now has Q over two from the first part and sphere number uh, two still has the original Q that it had to begin with. Okay, so that hasn't changed. All right, and then the final configuration. Again, what you have to have is that two and three have to have the same amount of final charge at the end because they have to be at the same potential. The only way they can have that is if the charge is the same. All right, so whatever this final charge is, QF, they have to be the same. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to end up adding both of those and then dividing them into two and that is going to be the Q final for each one. Okay, So if I go to this step here, the total charge that's available is 3Q over 2 and then what you're going to do is for each one of those you're going to get half of that. So again you're dividing by another 2. So you're going to get 3Q divided by 4 is going to be the final charge at the end here of um, the last step. Okay. So what you do is you need to get a number from this. So it's 3 over 4 uh, multiplied by uh, Q is 3.8 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs. All right, put that in the calculator. 0 0.75 times 3.8. Um, I get 2.85. I think the correct answer here is A in my books. Okay. Uh, not too bad. All right, this one here. Uh, if the position of sphere 1 is at the origin, so that's looking at panel D over here, and the position of sphere 2 is at x equals to D, it's kind of small here, but you should be able to see it, what region along the x-axis contains a point, obviously outside the spheres, where the electric field is 0? All right, so they give you these three regions. Um, I would split them up like this, right? So region A is out here when X is bigger than D but less than infinity. Okay. Uh, region B is between uh, those two spheres. And region C, actually when I look at this, I think there's a typo here. I think this is probably going from minus infinity. This is probably region C over here in this region. Okay. Okay. So you have to look now. We have two positive objects where are the fields going to be equal to zero? So again, I would just kind of draw them right here. Here's sphere one, here's sphere two. And look at the fields from each one. Let's make actually this one green, and let's make the sphere number two orange. If they are both positive, you know that sphere number one on this side produces a field in this direction, and anywhere here it produces an electric field that points away from it like this. Okay. Sphere number two is also positive, so it produces a field in this direction, it produces a field in this direction, and in this direction. Okay. So where are you going to add those in such a way that you get zero electric field? Uh, the only place it can be is in this region here. In the other two regions, you can see that these fields add together, right? So they always have a net field pointing to the right. And all the way here in the uh, left of sphere number one, you get both fields are adding in the same direction. So it really, I think, has to be between um, 0 and D. Sorry, that one's a little bit too chubby. Let me shrink that down a little bit here. B is the correct answer, I think. Let's try this. There you go. That's better. Okay. Um, all right, not too bad. Hopefully. Let's go to, to the next problem. Crushing these. Well, this looks like another University of Illinois uh, practice exam problem. So we have a solid spherical conductor, okay, conductor again, centered at the origin, that's the radius of that sphere. And the total charge, again, it's positive and it's five microcoulomb. All right, what is the magnitude of the electric field when your distance 0 0.8? Okay, so the key to this one here is we are outside of the sphere, right? If you're outside of the sphere, it behaves just like a point charge. So what you get is K, Q divided by the distance squared, distance squared. So we get 9 times 10 to the 9. We get 5 times 10 to the minus 6. 
and divided by 0 0.8 squared. All right, you put that in the calculator. Let me go ahead and do that. 9e to the 9 times 5e to the minus 6 divided by 0 0.8 squared uh, gives me like 70,000. Yeah. Oh, here they're just asking for the magnitude. So I think this one here, choice C is uh, the best one. Okay, not too bad. Uh, next thing. If we define the electrical potential to be zero at infinity, that's our reference, okay? And if it's a, like a sphere, yeah, that's fine. What is the potential when you're at the same distance now? Okay. Um, you're outside the conducting sphere. So again, it behaves just like a point charge when you are outside. Now, the definition of the potential produced by a point charge is like this. KQ divided by R only. So again, it's pretty straightforward. Just you have the same numbers here, 10 to the 9, 5 times 10 to the minus 6, and now it's only over 0 0.8. All right, put that in the calculator. Let's try that again. 9e to the 9 times 5e to the minus 6 divided by 0 0.8. Uh, 56,000. I notice I get a positive number here, so there's positives and negatives. You gotta be a little bit careful. It's a positive point charge, therefore the potential is a positive value. Okay. All right, so far so good. All right, next one. They say, if we define the potential to be zero at infinity, what is the potential now? This is a point that is inside the sphere, right? So you have to be careful here. When you calculate the potential inside a sphere, you don't use kq over the distance r, which is the distance from the center, okay? What we saw is that what you have to do is you have to take the radius of the sphere. The whole sphere is an equipotential, okay? And the value of the potential is whatever value you have at the surface, that is going to be the value of the potential at any point inside. Yeah, go ahead. You can ask your question. You can unmute and uh, ask your question. I do have to be able to hear you. I still can't hear you. Try to increase the volume here. Hmm. One second here. It's not that clear, the sound here. It's not clear for me either. Oh, there it is. Okay. Or maybe no. I think you you have to uncover your your mic, Martinez. Yeah. Or something. If not, you could type it down. I'm gonna continue with this. I don't think I made a mistake, so you can either type it out because I still can't hear you, which is weird because I heard you earlier. I see you. I see you loud and clear. You got microphone is jacked. Divided by. 0 0.4. Oh. Yes. 0 0.4. All right. We're going to keep going. I'm going to do this. 9e to the 9 times 5e to the minus 6 divided by 0 0.4. All right. I get a positive value and I get what looks like choice B here. All right, we're still waiting for Mr. Martinez's question, which shall remain mute. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, I can hear you a little bit now. Technology. Oh, what do we do if we had another charge in the sphere. Oh. Well, it's, it's usually not in, usually there's like a gap. I think there's another problem coming up when uh, there's a charge inside a shell or something. Okay? That may answer your question. I actually just uploaded a video. It was similar to what we did in class a point charge inside two spherical shells. Um, that also uh, might shed some light, I think, on your, on your concerns. Okay? All right. Let's move on. We are 20 minutes in. Hey, we're, we're crushing this. Already uh, three problems down. Man. Let's go. All right. Next. Uh, this one you've seen probably before. So uh, many people ask for this problem. So 
Uh, here it is. All right. No problem. So we have an insulating plane. Okay. It has a surface charge density. And actually, if I go down below, so it's sigma p. An insulating sphere. This has radius r, uh, surface charge density. Okay. The perpendicular distance from the plane. All right. Is written. All right. From the plane to the center of the sphere, we have a distance d. Uh, not too bad. Let's go see here. Sorry, somebody wants to get in. Let him back in. All right, first question here. So assume that we have this ratio here of sigma p to sigma zero. zero? Yeah. It's a little bit better. I mean, it's still not super loud. Okay. All right, so we're going to use these specific numbers. Okay, and sigma zero is just some, com some common factor. And we're also given this distance here between the plane and the center of the sphere. All right, at what perpendicular distance D0 from the plane is the magnitude of the net field zero? So let's go ahead and draw that. Imagine we have, we're looking at some point here between the plane and the sphere, okay? We know that the plane is positively charged. It produces a field that is constant and the field is going to be like this. I'll call it EP for plane. And we know the sphere is also positively charged. It produces an electric field that points opposite from it. Okay, I'm going to call this ES for the sphere. All right, what else? I think we're good. So the field is going to be zero, right? The field is going to be zero whenever we have, so E total, as long as both of those are equal and opposite to each other, okay? So when the magnitude of ES is equal to uh, the magnitude of EP, okay? So we have to write each one of those. Okay, so for a plane, uh, so this you have to know, for a plane, again, if you're only, it's only a single charged uh, two-dimensional sheet here, the value is the charge density divided by the, there's a factor of two epsilon zero, and that you can show from Gauss's law. Okay. I'm gonna substitute this value here. So this becomes five sigma zero divided by um, two epsilon zero. So that's the magnitude of the field EP. Okay. How would we write ES now? Um, okay. uh, ES, we're on the outside of the sphere, okay? And they tell us that we have, what's, what I don't like about this problem here is like you have an insulating sphere, right? But you only have a surface charge density. Oh, all right, I think that's fine. Um, so it behaves just like a point charge where all the charge is located at the center. It behaves the exact same way. So what would we do? Well, let's call this. If it behaves like a point charge, the field is going to be K. The total charge now is going to be what? It's the charge density multiplied by the area of that total sphere and divided by uh, R squared, okay? I'll just write it as R squared and let me go ahead and write R on that figure. R is the distance from the center all the way to the point where I'm evaluating that uh, electric field. So I could take this one step further here. I can do this, write it as K. The surface charge density here is written as 13 sigma zero. Okay. And the area is the area of this sphere. The area of the sphere is four pi capital R squared, okay. Divided by little r squared. Okay. So what we do now is we set both of those expressions to each other. And then what we want to do is you want to solve for what is this distance r. At the end, I could write it in terms of d0, and that's what I'm going to do. But as long as I can find some distance here, uh, then I can write it any way I want. All right, so this is what it looks like. So I have k, 13 sigma 0. I have 4 pi radius of the sphere squared divided by the distance from the center of that sphere has to be five over two, sigma zero, and epsilon zero, like this. 
One thing I'm going to do right now is instead of writing k, I'm going to write it as 1 divided by 4 pi epsilon 0. So we have a question here. Why is the area of the sphere not 4 thirds pi r squared? So remember for a sphere, the volume, the volume is 4 thirds pi r cube. Okay? The area of just the surface of the sphere is 4 pi r squared for a sphere. Okay? Good question. Don't forget that. All right, let's cancel out some common terms. I have epsilon 0 over here. I have epsilon 0 here. I've got 4 pi. I've got 4 pi. I'm going to get rid of that 1. I have sigma 0. I have sigma 0. Okay. All right, now what we can do, well, again, I'm trying to solve for little r. Okay, so we're going to bring it to the other side. So here you're left with 13 r squared. And I'm going to bring that 2 fifths over. And this is equal to little r squared. Uh, this gives me 26 over 5 r squared. All right, so at the end, I get the distance at least measured from the sphere where the field is 0. Uh, now you just have to take the square root of both sides. Again, for these numbers in this specific problem, this is what it ends up being. Let me just box this up. Now they wanted you to write it from a different position, right? They want to know what is the perpendicular distance from the plane. They don't want to know it from the position of the sphere, okay? Um, or the net electric, okay. So if you have a look again at this diagram here, what we just calculated was uh, this R value. What they really want is what is this distance D0, okay? D0. So uh, you can see from that diagram that you should have d0 plus little r is equal to d, okay, in this problem. And now I'm also going to use this factor here, that d they told us that is six times that radius, okay? So that's d0 plus r. So the last bit I want to solve for is 6r minus little r, which is this 26 over 5, um, Okay, so uh, this is kind of the final result here. It's not kind of the neatest, but 6 minus square root of 26 over 5. All of this multiplied by the radius of the sphere. Now, depending on how your problem, you might have different numbers here instead of 5 and 13 and 6. But uh, this is kind of the approach, right? You just want to set those fields equal to each other, right? And then solve for some distance. And at the end, just relate it back to the distance from the plane, this is a, an easy way to solve this problem. All right, hopefully that uh, question made sense. All right. Any questions on this one? If not, we'll move on. Crushing these four down. Let's go. All right, capacitor problem. You got to know your capacitors, okay? I'm going to tell you right now. There is a nice capacitor problem on there. Use an expression for the equivalent capacitance C12. All right. So C12 is just combining two parallel, right? So C12 has to be equal to C1 plus C2. That's how you combine parallel capacitors. Oh boy, one second here. I got to get the values. Oh boy, this is rookie, rookie stuff here. <laughs> All right, here are the values of the problem. Um, you can go ahead and do that. So this is 10.1 plus 10.2. We're left with 20.3. This is all in microfarad. That's the equivalent capacitance for C12. Okay. All right. Using the results, express the total equivalent capacitance. Okay. So now what you have, we have a simplified circuit where we've uh, represented everything here inside this red box here by C12. And now I have this equivalent capacitance that is in series with C3, okay? So if I combine everything here inside this orange box as one equivalent capacitance, uh, question part B says, what is the total equivalent capacitance of the circuit? Now, if there's only two, what you have to do is you can multiply them divided by the sum, okay? I could do this, C equivalent equals 1 divided by C12 plus 1 divided by C3 for capacitors in series. But again, you put this on a common denominator. You have to flip the fraction. 
what you end up getting is C equivalent is C12 multiplied by C3, C12 plus C3. Now we get the numbers, so you get 20.3 multiplied by 1.3 for this case, and 20.3 plus 1.3. You know the value has to be less than 1.3? 20.3 times 1.3, and all this divided by 20.3 plus 1.3. I get a value of 1.22 microfarad for the total equivalent capacitance of this circuit. All right, so that is part B. Now let's do part C down over here. Express the numerical value. Oh, okay, so that's easy. That's what we just did. This is part C, actually. Go ahead and highlight this, uh, 1.22 microfarad. All right, what else? Part D, express the charge Q stored in the circuit in terms of, okay. So again, now if you've represented this entire circuit here by one voltage and one equivalent capacitor, C equivalent. So the charge on that equivalent capacitor is just this. Uh, we could probably calculate it. Next one, calculate a numerical value. Okay, so part E is just getting the value of this. How much charge do we get? So our capacitance is 1.22 microfarad. So the charge will be calculated in microcoulomb here. And the voltage, I think, is oh, 12 volts. Okay. So Q in microcoulomb, 1.22 times 12 gives me 14.64. This is in microcoulomb. All right, just using our capacitor equation over here. Uh, let's go to F. Express the energy stored. Okay, so the energy, there's several ways of doing it, but I just found C equivalent. So one of my favorites is this. C equivalent of V squared, and it's V zero. Right, the potential difference across that capacitance, which is going to be the same potential difference across the battery. All right, so that's the expression, and the last one you just have to calculate a value. So we substitute our numbers here. C equivalent is 1.22. Uh, that's in microfarad. Um, that's fine. I don't have to put the 10 to the 6. I'm going to calculate something in microjoules, which is what they're asking for right now. Okay, well, let's go ahead and do that. So we get 0 0.5 times 1.22 times 12 squared. I get like 87.8. That is in microjoules. All right. That's pretty straightforward. There's only three capacitors, so um, not too bad, hopefully. Again, you just have to know the combination of series and parallel, right? It's different from resistors, so don't get confused with that, right? All right, next problem. Uh, this is another one that came from the um, from the assignment. One second here, I gotta I gotta move it over here so we can see it. All right, this is a problem from the assignment. So uh, here we go it's from one of the latest assignments. Um, so we have a air filled in the top figure here that has a capacitance C zero. Highlight that. When it's connected to a battery with a voltage V0, okay, it has a charge Q0 and the energy is U0 in the top figure. All right, once the capacitor has charged, then the switch is opened. Uh, and finally, a slab of material with a dielectric constant K is inserted in that gap. Okay, so kind of a standard problem. Um, what else? And finally, the slab of material Oh, actually, I think I misread. Once the capacitor has charged, then the switch is opened. Okay, so the switch is open right now, right? So what does that mean? Which of the following quantities does not change when the dielectric material is inserted? Okay, so we got to think about this one, right? There were two cases that we had to look at. When the battery was connected and when it wasn't connected, okay? So this is a case when it is not connected, okay? Not connected, okay? When it's not connected, what did we say? 
we said that the charge remains the same. Okay. So which of the following does not change? Uh, the charge can't change if it's not connected to the battery. Okay. When the switch is open, it's like it's not connected to the battery. Uh, part B says, enter an expression for the potential difference between the plates after you, the addition of the dielectric material. All right, part B, remember now you are getting some polarization over there, right? So the potential difference ends up going lower because the electric field goes down, okay? So the potential difference should look like this, goes down. Remember we had that summary sheet in class where... I showed you the two cases. Okay. What else? Enter an expression for the charge stored after the addition of... All right. Well, it's the charge doesn't change, so it's just this. <laughs> That's easy. Okay. Uh, D says, enter an expression for the capacitance. Ah. Okay. Well, well you did insert a dielectric here, right? When you insert a dielectric, I said, uh, the capacitance always increases. And the value of the capacitance is that dielectric constant times the value when it is air-filled. Okay? Capacitance always increases when you put a material inside. And the last one is E. Write an expression for the energy stored after you've put in this dielectric. Okay? Well, you think about this. Um, now, there's different ways of writing this energy formula. Uh, I think uh, we use the fact that Q did not change. So I would do something like this. Q squared over C. Okay, And we're looking when the material is there. So now we substitute our value. We know that Q is simply Q0. That doesn't change. However, look at what happens to the capacitance. The capacitance is K multiplied by C0. Okay. I'm going to take that factor of 1 over K outside of everything, and look what I have left. One half, Q0 squared divided by C0. Okay. This whole thing in the bracket looks like what? This is what the initial energy is before I've added in the dielectric material. So what you end up getting is that initial value divided by K. Okay. So you now have less potential energy in the case where you have uh, the same charge. Let's look at this one. You have two infinite non-conducting sheets of charge and one conducting slab over here. Um, okay. The conducting slab is electrically neutral. All right, so that's important, and it's conducting. Neutral means it has no excess charge, right? There's no charge on it. It doesn't mean that the charges can't separate, but that's okay. Um, the densities on the two sheets here are, okay, so this guy here is positive. And this guy here is negative, so that's important. All right, first say they say the x component of the electric field at x equals to 0 0.9. 0 0.9 is some point over here. Okay. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to call this one here the red one, and let's switch a different color. Let's, Christmas is around the corner. Let's switch the green here for the negatively charged one. All right, so if the red one is positive, at this point, the field produced by that one, let's just call it E1. The magnitude of it is sigma 1 divided by 2 epsilon 0. Okay. Uh, the green one is negative. It produces a field that points in this direction. Okay. The magnitude of E2 is going to be sigma 2 divided by 2 epsilon 0. Okay. Notice those fields are in different directions. Okay. And which one is going to be bigger? Um, it has to be the one with the larger charge density. Okay. It's almost twice the size. So at the end, my total field, okay, I'm going to choose here this direction here to be the positive direction. Okay. So this is how I would write it. I would write it as positive E1 okay, and minus E2. Okay. And here I'm just substituting the magnitudes. Okay. So I would have like sigma 1 over 2 epsilon 0 and minus sigma 2 over 2 epsilon 0. I like to put the absolute values in here just to remind myself that 
I've already taken into consideration the direction of these fields here. So I don't want to like put in an extra negative in here. Okay, that's not that wouldn't be right. All right, so now we're just going to get a magnitude. So this is five minus 9.5. So this becomes minus 4.5 uh, microcoulomb. So that's uh, 10 to the minus six and divided by two times epsilon zero, 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. Uh, the answer has to be in the negative direction. All right, now we just have to be careful. You can see that one is half the other. They want to see if you have the, the right form for the equation. Um, these guys are pretty smart. Four points, sorry, 4.5 e to the minus six divided by two, divided by 8.85 e to the minus 12. Survey says the 2.54 value is the correct one. This one. All right, standard problem. All right, the induced, question six says, the induced charge density on the left side of the conductor. Okay, so what they're looking for here is this guy. Imagine you have some charges on the left side and some charges on the right side, okay? Think about that conductor now, okay? Now that conductor is placed between these two plates. It's placed inside an electric field, right? The electric field produced by this guy points, uh, points this way. The electric field produced by sigma two, um, it's negatively charged, so it also points that way, right? The field inside is bigger than what we calculated before, right? Because you have to add both of those contributions to get the total field between the plates, okay? The total field between the plates, let me just write this down here, between, Uh, between the plates we have, we have to add both of those contributions up. So I have to start off by finding what is the total field, okay? So here we're gonna have sigma one plus sigma two divided by two epsilon zero. So let me at least get this value here. Um, that's five plus 9.5. This will be 14.5 times 10 to the minus six divided by two, 8.85. 10 to the minus 12. All right, E total, 14.5 E to the minus six divided by two divided by 8.85 E to the minus 12. All right, I get like roughly 8 point, oh, 8 point say one nine times 10 to the one, two, three, four, five, 10 to the five. All right, that's in volts per meter. <clears throat> okay, uh, that's okay. Now we want to figure out what happens to that conductor now. So let me go ahead and draw that slab here, over here. Remember, if it's a conductor, what you do require in the conductor is that the total field inside has to be zero, <laughs> okay? Well, I have to cancel out this field over here. This field is huge and it's pointing this way. So the conductor, let me trace that in orange, the conductor better produce a field equal to this value, but in the opposite direction. The only way it can do that is if you have some induced surface charges here, and you have some induced surface charges on this side. Notice that whatever charges I have here on the right, they have to be equal and opposite to the charges here on the left, okay? So again, if you call this sigma R and you call this sigma L, since the original conductor had no charge, if I would add them all up, I have to have zero. There was no net charge initially on that conductor. So they have to be the same. Now we're only looking for what's going on on the left-hand side. Okay. So what you have to do now is, how do you get total field equal to zero inside? Well, it has to produce a magnitude equal to this field. What is the field produced by both of these surface charges over here, okay? Uh, the field produced by this orange field right here, this is, just treat this like a parallel plate. This total field is sigma, just call it sigma L, doesn't matter if you choose sigma R, they're the same thing, but it's only divided by epsilon zero, and that's really the key right here. 
Okay? So this value here must be sigma L divided by epsilon zero. Okay? So at the end, what you should see is should be 14.5 divided by two. Okay? If I go back up here to this other expression, you can go ahead and calculate it. Uh, what you're gonna get is it has to be negative and it has to be 14.5 divided by two. Okay? So A has to be the correct answer for that. You, uh, can you explain that part one more time? You said 14.5, uh, you added the charge densities. Why, why'd, you, why'd you do oh, that? Sure. Or like your last step, why'd you use that, that value for your last step? Okay. Because that's just the left side. Um, yeah, I mean, here, do you agree that it has to be equal to this? Yeah. The field? Yes. Okay. So if you multiply this by, how did I get this number? I got this number from this expression right here, right? Right. Okay. So let me go over here and make some room. So what you have is sigma 1 plus sigma 2 divided by 2 epsilon 0 has to be equal to what? Has to be equal to the field inside that conductor. It's sigma L divided by epsilon 0. So what you have here, cross out those. If I add both of these charge densities, which is what I did over here to get this value of 14.5, right? Once I divide it by two, I get 7.25, okay? And I know it has to be negative just from this picture, right? From the directions of the fields. The induced has to be negative on this side. Okay. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I think it starts. Yeah. So it basically comes from here. So this here you have five, here you have 9.5, that's 14.5, and divided by two, okay? This came from adding up the two fields from the red plate and the green plate. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, good question, okay. Yeah, make sure you understand this one. There's kind of similar ones in the other exams, right? They're, they're all kind of similar. It's similar to the one I, the YouTube video also is also very similar to this one. So you can go watch that and maybe I explain it slightly different than uh, what I did tonight, okay? But give you an idea on how to do that. All right, we've got a few more. One, two, three, four, five more problems. We've got a little bit more energy. 40 minutes left. We got this. All right, let's move on. Oh, six capacitors, my goodness. Killing me here. 12 volt battery. All right, well, I can already see some things that are gonna jump out at me and simplify it. All right, so we're given all the values of the capacitances, that's good. Uh, it's a 12 volt power supply. What's the equivalent of the six capacitors? All right, so that's not too bad. I like those problems, they're kind of easy, all right? These are softballs. So you can combine these ones. Let's do C12. Things in parallel are easy because you just have to add them up, right? So this is, um, well, oh, for the viewers online, let's just do an extra step. This is a rule, C1 plus C2. Um, this is going to be 10 plus 16, which gives me 26 microfarad, okay? Uh, let's look at this guy, C4, 5. I can group both of those. We have two capacitors in parallel. You just add them up. C4 plus C5, oh, look at that, you get 26 again. Oh, wow, that's cool. Is C3 and C6 in series? Yes. One step ahead of me, man, Vlad. You have that burrito yet? <laughs> yeah, I do. All right, good, I could tell, man. You need something John, though. Oh, <laughs> bad move. All right, so we've got those ones. Yeah, let's combine. So even if the battery is kind of splitting them, it doesn't matter. I can move the battery down here below, it doesn't matter. So I could also really form a C3, C3, C36 right now, just to simplify it, okay? C36, now you gotta be careful. These are in series, right? If they're in series and if there's two of them, you have to do the reciprocal, right? One trick I use, if there's only two, you can multiply them and divide it by the sum. So C3, C6 divided by C3 plus C6. Uh, C3 is 50, C6 is 40, and then 50 plus 40. Oh, this one, I'm gonna need the calculator for that one. 50 times 40 divided by 90, 
All right, I get 22.2, close enough. Microfarad. All right, now we're not done. So uh, now what do we do? They want to know the total capacitance. So we've just kind of, this is what we have so far, right? We've got this, we've got this new capacitor, C36. We have everything down here, C12. And we've got everything down over here, uh, C45. Okay. What? Watch what I can do now, right? I can group C12 and C45 together, right? These two guys are in, they're in parallel with each other. So that's easy. So we're going to call that C1245. <laughs> okay? Combines all of those. And that's easy. All you have to do is add both of those together. So you get C12 plus C45, which gives me that one I can do in my head, 52 microfarad. All right. All right, let's redraw the circuit. <laughs> we have our battery. We have C36. And now I've combined all those other ones. Guess what? We've got C1245. All right, the last step. The last step is I just want my battery and I want one total equivalent. So all I have to do now is combine. Let's try a different color here. Let's go crazy with the colors. Combine both of these are now in series. All right, if they're both in series, again, if there's only two, what you can do is just multiply them and divide it by the sum. So we have C1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, the last one, the total equivalent capacitance of this circuit. C3, 6 multiplied by C1, 2, 4, 5. C3, 6 plus C1, 2, 4, 5. All right, we're going to do this multiplication here. Uh, C36 was 22.2. C123, this was 52 microfarad. All right, and here we have 22.2 plus 52. All right. C1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. All right, let me go ahead and do that. 22.2 times 52 divided by 22.2 plus 52. Oh, let it be one of those numbers, 15.5.6. Oh, phew. This is like the worst feeling, right? <laughs> it's like when you go ahead and you do the calculation, you think you've done everything, and then you go back, and it's not one of those choices. Good gracious. All right, so I think choice C is the good one. Uh, next one, which capacitors have the same charge? All right, so we need things that are in, remember the rules, right? Things have to be in series to have the same charge. So three and six are in series, right? Yeah, these are not. One and four are not in series. Uh, four and five are in parallel, not in series. Okay, so that one's pretty straightforward. Oh, the next one, look at, they want to know the energy stored in C3. Okay. So how do we find the energy stored in C3? I'm going to go back to um, this picture right here, okay? I'm going to go back to this guy, right? Because, first of all, um, to know the energy stored, let's, let's do this. Th which, think about the equation we're going to use. We're going to take the value of the capacitance C3, okay? Um, there's different ways I can write it. I could write the voltage across 3 squared. That's one way. This is probably going to be a little bit hard to do. I think the easiest thing to do is to use the equation with the amount of charge on Q3 divided by that capacitance. I think this is going to be the easiest way. Because I see C3 is in parallel, uh, sorry, is in series with C6. You know those have the same charge. And then you know that it's going to have the same charge as this guy because it's also in series with 1, 2, 4, 5. Okay, so all of those are going to have the same charge. So let's start by maybe finding the charge on this guy. Okay, so how would you find the charge on this guy? Our total equivalent capacitor. Well, that's the easy one, right? So Q is equal to C, 1, 2, 3, 
four, five, six, multiplied by the voltage of that battery, which is 12. Okay, so this guy here is going to be 15.6 multiplied by 12, and this is going to be in a micro uh, coulomb. Uh, I get 187 here, micro coulomb. Um, 0.2 maybe, uh, that's fine, okay? All right, so we know the charge on this guy, okay? But this is what? This replaced, look at, what can we say about the charge? If we know the charge on this total equivalent, it has to be the same charge as C12 and C36. And it also has to be the same charge on C3 and C6. So at the end, this is the same amount of charge on C3, okay? This guy here is also Q3. So all we have to do now is just evaluate that into our equation, okay? So you're going to have, sorry, I run out of space here, 1 half, uh, 187 times 10 to the minus 6. I have to square that value and divide it by its capacitance. Its capacitance here was 50. 50 times 10 to the minus 6, okay? Uh, let's put all that in a calculator, see if I get 1.5 times 187 oh, e to the minus 6 squared and divided by 50 e to the minus 6. All right, now I got to be a little bit careful. I'm going to write down the number that I got here. So I got a U3 that was equal to uh, roughly 3.5 times 10 to the minus four joules. Now I have a number in joules, okay? Careful, these are all in microjoules, okay? So if I move the decimal over two places to the right, I'm gonna get 10 to the minus six, which is microjoules, okay? So this guy is the best answer right here. Well, kind of a lot of work, right? But we still have to just use the fact that we know that the charge has to be the same if we have things in series, okay? Uh, good problem though, okay? This is kind of standard stuff. These are a gift to exams, right? Although it's kind of long, it's you're just applying the basic rules to each one. Okay. All right, let's move on. We've got four more pages. We've got half hour, 7.5 minutes per problem. All right. Um, Kind of another one of these, I think we've seen every single configuration here. So actually, Callie, if you, uh, anyway, if there's some things you didn't understand about that previous one, maybe this one will also clarify it. Okay. Um, so we show three infinite planes. Uh, the, the right two planes, let me just highlight some things. The right two are insulating with a uniform charge density of five. The left plane is uncharged and conducting, okay? Same kind of thing as before. We show three Gaussian surfaces here, okay? Kind of uh, these pill boxes, right? Rectangles. All three have identical dimensions in the YZ plane, uh, but the surface S3, this one here, is, is just wider. Uh, question 19 says, What's the contribution to the X component of the electric field at mark point P from the plane on the right? Okay, so only from the plane on the right. So let me highlight that one. So the plane on the right is this guy. And they want to know just its contribution to the electric field right here at point P. All right, so you're neglecting anything else happening in this problem. Okay. First of all, what is the charge density here? So we have sigma, and sigma is 5, and it's positive. So if you look at point P, if I just draw point P over here, and I draw this one here in red as sigma, at point P, which is to the left of that plane, um, it produces a positive field like this. Okay? But that field points in the negative x direction. So it has to be a negative value. So right away, I would get rid of these three. Okay? Can't be any of those. How do you find the field due to one, it's just always the same thing, sigma divided by two epsilon zero, because we're only considering the highlighted one here. Uh, this is five coulombs per meter squared, 
uh, divided by 2 times 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. Oh, let's go ahead and do that. 5 divided by 2 divided by 8.85. I get something that has 2, 8 in it. Um, it looks like it's going to be choice B. Okay. So I'll just go ahead and write that. So minus, uh, sorry, I don't have a minus here, but you can see, sorry, from this direction here. So it, it has to be in the negative direction. Okay. Um, so let me just go ahead and just write the magnitude then. Magnitude as uh, 2.82 times 10 to the 11 uh, newtons per coulomb. And the direction is that way. Okay. Which is why it's negative here. All right. What is the induced charge on the right side of the conducting slab? Okay, so this is our conducting slab down over here. Okay. So we're going to have induced charges on the left and the right because it's conducting and you do require that the total field is equal to zero inside that conductor. Let's go ahead and write it. Okay. So whatever you have here on the right, you're going to have to have something on the left. We know that it has um, it's probably uncharged at the beginning. Let me go ahead. Where did I see that? Oh, right here. They do tell you that in this problem statement that there is no net charge okay, of that conductor. So these are kind of always the same. What you need to do is you need to find the field produced by these two sheets over here. Okay. So let's consider the red one and this blue one over here. The red one, again, they're both positively charged, right? They both have a charge density of 5, right? So the red one here produces a field in that direction. <laughs> it's the value we just calculated. And the blue one, uh, this guy right here, also produces a field like this. Okay? So our total field is what at the end? E total is equal to E, whatever, red plus E blue. They're both the same, right? They're both this value up here, but we have two of them. So it ends up being sigma over epsilon zero. And sigma is the five coulombs per meter squared. Okay. So what does the conductor need? Inside the conductor, we need to have E inside equals to zero. You always have to have that. So it means it has to produce a field like this. How does the conductor produce a field pointing to the right? It means it has to acquire some positive charges on the left-hand side and equal and opposite charges on the right-hand side. Okay? That's the only way. And guess what? The conductor, the inside field, better be equal to this, everything on the outside. That's the only way it's going to, um, to cancel out. So how do we write a field? If we have this type of charge density, okay, again, it's positive here, and it's minus sigma L on this side. Uh, this equation right here is always, because there's two uh, contributions, it's the charge density over epsilon zero, right? So you see at the end, you're going to have to have five uh, coulombs per meter squared. Okay? If I have five coulombs per meter squared here, Minus 5 coulombs per meter on the other side, uh, you're going to be okay. Um, so this here has to be the answer. Okay. Based on that reasoning here. Okay. I have a question about the first part. Yes. Uh, so you made the electric field point to the left when it's, it's actually closer to the, the left plate. Okay. Not be pointing to the right. Yeah. So we have to be careful with. Yeah. You just got to be. Remember, the electric field produced by a plate is independent of the distance from the plate, right? Okay. Right. The electric field from a plate that has a charge density is this. Okay. There's no distance here. Right. right. That, so that's number one. Number two says they only want to know the x component of the electric field. Okay. For only from the plane on the right, okay? So this is all you're doing, right? You're, you have to strip away half the problem, right? This is all we have. We have this charge density, which is five, okay? And this is my point P, okay? That's it. That's the whole problem, okay? 
They say ignore the conducting plane. That's this one. Ignore that. <laughs> and the middle plane. And this. <laughs> ignore both of those. So if this is a positive charge, it produces a field like this. Okay. That's why I drew this up here. Okay. Yeah, careful with some of these problems, right? You really have to read them because like they, although they, they draw a figure that contains a lot of different components, sometimes they ask you only for like the X component of a field, only include the sphere, not the wire, you know? So be a little bit careful with that because all these other choices involve you including those other bits, <laughs> okay? So if you pick wrong, you could do all the right math, but you just simply misread the question, okay? All right. Three more. Let's go. We're right on time, too. I love it. Oh, this is a big one. Oh, this is a bad one. <laughs> the toughest one, I think. I don't know. <laughs> haven't done it yet. Let's see. Uh, hollow uh, insulating cylinder of inner radius. Of, say, all right. So you, given all these dimensions, that kind of um, inner cylinder is insulating, okay? And then outside, it's neutral, and it's a metal tube. All right, so metal. Again, you're given the dimensions. It has a certain thickness to it. What is the magnitude of the electric field? Okay, and all of these, yeah, careful. These are all cylinders. They're not spheres. Sometimes, right? You show a cross section here, so they look like spheres, right? The cross section of the sphere would look identical to this, but you have to keep in mind, especially if you're using Gauss's law, right? You don't want to use the equations for a sphere when it's a cylinder. All right, but we want to know at this distance right here. So we have to locate where exactly is that distance. 0.73. Look, it's a little bit bigger than this guy. Okay. It's not quite at C. So it's kind of inside here, okay, where there's no material. Okay? So for question 22 is like, what is the electric field right here? And just the magnitude. Okay. So now you imagine you have a Gaussian surface. Okay, uh, that's the Gaussian surface. Uh, what else? Well, now we would use the equation, right? Uh, we can use Gauss's law, for example. Gauss's law for this cylinder. Again, you've got a picture of a cylinder that goes into the page here. Uh, this Gaussian surface has a radius little r. Okay? So we have Gauss's law. We write E dot dA equals to Q enclosed divided by epsilon zero. This side is always the same for a cylinder, okay? It's E multiplied by two pi r, multiplied by the length, okay? One over epsilon zero. All right, how much charge is enclosed here inside this Gaussian surface? It's the total charge of this shaded region inside, right? This hollow cylinder. So what is that charge of this entire hollow cylinder? It has an inner radius A, it has an inner or outer radius B, okay? And look what they tell you. The charge density is this, okay? So it's going to be the charge density rho multiplied by what? By the volume of this object here, okay? But what you have to be careful of is you only include the volume here. You don't include that inner volume, right? So it's really only this volume that you're included. And you also have to include the length. Remember, it's not just the area here. So what we have to do is you have to find the area of this uh, yellow shaded area and then multiply by the length of the tube that you're considering. That is going to be the volume of this entire object. Okay, so let's keep going. So here we're going to have 1 over epsilon 0. Rho is just a number. Our volume now is the area. Think about the area. This is how I would write it. I would write it as pi pb squared. That's the area of the outside circle minus pi a squared. That's the area of the inside. I want to take away what's on the inside. I also need to multiply by the length to get the volume at the end of the day. Okay. So this guy right here is nothing more than the area. All right, now you have to put everything together. So don't forget on the left-hand side, we still have a bunch of terms. We have two pi r and we have l. 
Notice some terms cancel out. The length cancels out, okay? And unfortunately, that's about it for us, okay? So we do have to substitute quite a few numbers in here. So I'm going to go ahead and write down one more expression. So this is going to be 2 pi epsilon 0 uh, over the distance r that I want to evaluate the field. In the numerator, I, I have the charge density. And then I'm left with this area here. Actually, let me factor out the pi. Here I'm left with b squared minus a squared. And actually, those pi's cancel out. So that saves me a bit of work. All right, now you, you have to try to do this in your calculator. Good luck, everybody. So this is, oh, well, this is 3. That's doable. Now what's b? b is 0.675 squared minus uh, 0 0.45 squared. If I get this right, man, I'm going to have some, a bowl of ice cream after I'm done. 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. All right, now we're looking for the distance. The distance is this, 0 0.743. All right, here goes calculator time, boys. Three times bracket. <laughs> 675 squared minus 0 0.45 squared. Oh, I'm going to try to do this in one step. This is going to be hard. 2 times 8.85 e to the minus 12 times 0 0.743. Bracket. All right. Oh, man. All right. I get 10 to the 10, and my number is, let's go ahead and write this down. I see it. I see it as a choice. So exciting. 5.77 is what I get times 10 to the 10, and that should be in units of newtons per coulomb because I had all the dimensions correct. And look at that. It's pretty close. I'll take that. I'll take that to the bank. Let's go. Man, it's kind of a lot of work for only a three selection multiple choice. U of I crushing it. All right. What is the magnitude of the electric field at a radius of 0 0.99 meters from the origin? All right. We have to find where is this distance here. So let's go back. Oh, 99. So it's a little bit bigger than C, and it's less than D. Bigger than C... Oh, C is on the inner wall, so you're actually inside this, this dashed area here. Well, look what that is. It is a metal tube. By definition, the electric field has to be zero inside. That's kind of nice. That makes up for the previous one. <laughs> All right, it's a conductor. Definition. All right, what is the total charge per unit length induced on the inner surface of the metal tube. So it's kind of related to what's going on here, okay? And what they want to know is, so you have this, all right, I'm going to have to draw this. I'm only going to draw some of this outside uh, cylindrical tube, okay? We just said E is zero on the inside here. But I have all of this charge that I'm enclosing. Right? Because I have a charge density and I have a volume. But how are you going to get zero field here? You're only going to get zero field if I have a certain amount of charge on this inside wall. And then I have to have the opposite on the outside wall. Okay. What is the charge on the inside, uh, this shaded area? We said it was positive, right? Oh yeah, because the charge density is positive. So actually I've got those signs switched around. Right? On the inside wall, you better have some negative charge because I need to cancel out the total charge uh, inside this inner part. Okay? What they're asking me for is how much charge I have per unit length. Okay? So what they're looking for really is how much charge you have on the inside per unit length. Okay? That is going to be the lambda. Okay? They're all negative, so that's okay. okay? And we know it has to be negative. Now, how do you determine that? Well, you have to cancel out all of the charge, right? All of this charge over here that you have inside that tube. How much charge do you have inside the tube? We've already kind of done that over here. It's this value here. Okay, it has to be this value. So actually, unfortunately, I didn't calculate it separately. Okay, so the charge that you're going to have on the inside... Uh, per unit length has to be this 
total charge that you're going to have, so the density times the volume, which is pi b squared uh, minus pi a squared, okay? and again, times the length, right? This is the total charge, and you also want to have this per unit length, okay? So this is what you have. This is what the lambda is, right? It's charge per unit length. This top here is the charge on the, in, uh, on the yellow, but you want the charge per unit length. So actually, good thing, you see that these lengths here cancel out. So really, all you're left with is calculating what this guy is. The charge density times the area, that cross-sectional area. So we have to go back and just uh, basically substitute uh, three. Uh, we have to put the pi back in there, so I, let's go ahead and do this. So this is going to be three pi, and then these numbers here, 0 0.675 squared, and minus 0 0.45 squared. This is going to give me the right units, okay? All right, we get lambda is equal to minus 2.39 uh, coulombs per meter for the line density, so that is choice E is the correct answer for this choice. All right, so this is kind of pretty standard. Um, so you have this uh, half circle here. It has a line charge density, and its radius is R, and the total charge on it is 15, okay? So that's important. Uh, if R equals 5, they want to know what lambda is. Okay, so lambda, again, it's that total charge. Uh, divided by the total length, right? Whatever that length is. And since it's a semicircle, um, it's total, it's half of the circumference, right? So the circumference is 2 pi r, so this would just be half of that, it's pi r. Okay. So lambda here would be 15 microcoulomb, um, and then this here would be pi, and the radius is 5 centimeters, so 0 0.05. All right. Well, let's redeem myself here. 15 divided by shift pi divided by 0 0.05. And I get like uh, 95. Yeah. This guy. Oh, boy. I'm using the fat highlighter again. Let's go back here. Choice B. All right. Um, charge per meter. What's the correct expression, all right, for the X component? So the X component is the component here, right? Uh, this is positively charged, and they want to know um, ch -ch -ch at the origin. Okay. So again, what you do is you break this down, and this is a little charge dq. That guy produces a field de right there, okay? And the field is just that of a point charge. Um, actually, I'm going to use the same, yeah, little r is the radius, Okay. Um, now, what you want to do here is, again, every time there's a dq on that side, there's one on this side, right? So it's going to produce a field like this, okay? What you end up wanting to do is you only want to know the x component here, okay? Because that's all they want to know. So the x component of that field is going to be dE multiplied by cos of the I angle theta, okay? So now you substitute our value as k dq over r squared cosine of theta, okay. and that's the little bit of field dex from one of those charges. Okay. Now you look at these choices, they all involve k, they involve lambda, and they also involve d theta. Okay. Our, ours doesn't have that right now, all we have is dq. Okay. But you have to remember that our charge density here, this is really dq per unit length, and the length here is a little bit of arc Right? You consider this here to be a little bit of arc length, that is ds. Okay? So this is something you have to know. So you have to be able to write that little bit of arc length uh, should be equal to the radius. Uh, let's use the same letters. Little r is the radius multiplied by the angle d theta. So this is how you can introduce d theta over here. So again, instead of writing ds here, what I have in the numerator, what I end up writing is r d theta. So this is how you can eliminate dq in our expression, okay? So this is important, right? Because we always see this for this uh, circle. So dq ends up being that charge density, charge per unit length, multiplied by the radius, multiplied by d theta, okay? And this is what you substitute into here. 
So we go back here, you go K. Instead of DQ, I write this, lambda, R, D theta, cos theta is still there, and divided by R squared. Now you can see that one of the R's cancels with the one at the bottom, and this gives me like a little bit of, of X field. What you want to do is you want to add them all up now, okay? Uh, but this should look like one of these expressions. It shouldn't have sine theta in there. You can get rid of that. It's not zero, that's for sure. It's not sine theta. So the only thing left is you, it's either over R squared or it's over R. Those are the two choices, okay? And But you can see that it started out as over R squared, but then one of them canceled out, okay? So that's where it gets a little bit tricky, okay? So But the right answer has to be choice E here. Uh, what kind of point charge should be placed at this point over here? Let me clean up this figure here. It's kind of messy. Um, all right. All right, for the last question, what kind of point charge should be placed right here in order to make the net electric field at the origin vanish? So again, the net electric field that we're going to calculate here if we did this whole integral, we would get a field produced by the ring, that, which would be this way. Right? So this guy here, if it's a positive point charge, right? if it's positive, it's going to produce a field in the opposite direction, and that would cancel it out. Okay, So it really has to be a positive point charge placed there. All right, kind of a nice problem, okay? It throws everything at you. Um, all right, last one for tonight, guys. Bedtime. Oh, not this one again. This looks like the same kind of stupid problem. Okay, infinite line charge, all right, is now, oh, this is the line charge? Okay, so I was looking at the wrong, at the wrong bit. All right, right there, we have a positive charge density it is in parallel to the z-axis um, as shown. Okay, so that's the position right here. Find the magnitude of the electric field at point P, okay, that is located a certain distance away here, all right. Uh, we assume that the line charge does not affect of the metal sphere. All right. Um, do they want us to include, so I don't know if this is the entire question. Oh, I think you have to include both objects, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure you have to include the sphere and the line charge, right? So find the magnitude of the electric field, the total electric field at point P. All right, so let's think about this. Let's let this line charge here be red. Its electric field at point P is going to point like this, okay? That is the field from the line, from this. This entire metal sphere and the metal inside and the insulator, it doesn't matter what it is, um, this entire thing is has a net charge that is positive, right? It's plus two microcoulomb. So it behaves, since I'm on the outside of it, it behaves just like a point charge, right, placed right here, okay? So that positive point charge produces an electric field in this direction. Let's call this ES. So what you have to do is you have to find each magnitude and just figure out which one is bigger and which one is, okay? Add them up as vectors, basically. So this is what the total would look like. I'm going to take this direction to be the positive direction. So my total would be E lambda, which would be a positive value, minus E of all of the spherical objects. Okay. So what is the field due to a, a line? It's 2K lambda divided by R. Okay. That equation is on the equation sheet, minus the spheres. K, Q total of the spheres, which is our 2 microcoulomb, divided by... All right, now we've got to be careful with these distances. For the wire, this is the distance R, okay? For the sphere, it's the distance from the center. I'm going to call it RS here. And it's RS squared. Okay, so let's go ahead and just substitute some of these numbers. So we have two. Uh, actually, let me, oh, let me factor out a K because we have K in both terms. So we have two lambda over R minus Q total divided by the distance from the center of the sphere to the point where I'm evaluating. I'm going to go ahead and f just write both of these down separately in meters just to have it ready to plug into the equation. Okay, So the wire here is at minus 30 
and the point P is at minus 21, okay? So that looks like 8.5 centimeters, so 0 0.85 meters, okay? And the sphere is probably at the origin, okay? So the distance to point P is going to be 21.5 centimeters, okay? Or 0.215 meters. So now I have everything I need. So 10 to the 9, this is 2. Uh, the lambda is uh, 4 times 10 to the minus 6 divided by R 0 0.085 okay. minus Q total is 2 microcoulomb 10 to the minus 6 uh, divided by RS 0 0.215 squared okay oh boy this is another complicated one where I have to punch in a lot of numbers so let's hopefully I can do this right 2 times 4 e to the minus 6 divided by 0 0.085 minus 2 e to the minus 6 divided by 0 0.215 squared equals times 9 e to the 9. All right, I get 457, 4, yeah, 460 basically. Okay, let me go ahead and write that down. Uh, 4.5758. Uh, times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And that is in newtons per coulomb. Okay. Uh, if I only keep two significant figures, I think I would kind of get this guy right here. 